Hello everyone and welcome back to my Colonization 2.5x series in Kerbal Space Program 1.3.1. In this episode we're going to begin by launching a scanner probe to the moon and Minmus to figure out where the resources are to better position our bases. So the idea is that this scanner will go to the moon first, handle the resource scan and then travel over to Minmus as well, but we'll see if it can handle both. Uh, here we have our lightest launcher so far, one you have not seen before, the Titan II, again from Lonesome Robots. And uh, we're just going to proceed with launching it here, so here goes the script, and I'll talk about it more on the way up. Okay, off it goes, and this is an LR87 engine, and you can see its stats there right now, 289 seconds at sea level, About it's got to be about 800 kilonewtons. And the interesting thing about the Titan II, of course, is it hot stages, which means it ignites the second stage engines before decoupling. It's actually just one main engine and then vernier engines, you'll see that. Uh, but that's why it's got these little vents here in the second stage, and that's to allow the exhaust to go out when it hot stages. The reason it does that is to settle the fuel, make sure that the engine is lit while the fuel is settled. Otherwise, the, the fuel in the stage could be sloshing if you try and separate this stage first and then later light this stage. Yeah, the fuel might slosh about and not properly get into the engine. So this is our lightest launcher. I don't plan on having anything lighter uh, unless we make something reusable. Okay, getting ready for first stage separation. Well, actually, second stage ignition, then first stage separation as planned. Okay, so that is our second stage engine, an LR-91, and you can see its stats there. Very good specific impulse for vacuum, and that's why it is where it is. Not, not exactly the nozzle shape I would expect. I, that is sort of the nozzle shape for the LR-91, but uh, it's an interesting nozzle shape, let's put it that way. And you can see the tiny little verniers on there, very nice on this particular model. Okay, fairing separation, and you can see our scanner. Now, you might note that I do not have ScanSat here, and that's because while ScanSat is more realistic, if you will, in terms of the way it scans things, I'm not really going for realism particularly. Um, so, we're just going to do the survey scanner the normal stock way, and that's simpler, but the main reason I don't want to do ScanSat is because it, it's a background process and it'll actually create lag for everything going on afterwards. Uh, put, picture it this way. You've got a satellite uh, going around another planet scanning it, right? And it's scanning little bits at a time. Well, ScanSat has to pay attention to that the whole time. Ignore the little pulsing of the thrust. That's because it's trying to keep the time to apoapsis to 40 seconds. But um, it has to keep track of that while you're doing your other missions. And that means that it's creating a tiny little bit of extra lag for all the other missions. Actually, not so tiny. If you ever brought up the ScanSat map and the big map, it's uh, it's not exactly lag-free. Uh, so it's a sort of cumbersome interface. And I mean, I, I like it in principle, but as long as I'm trying to keep this as smooth as possible, because we're going to have a lot of missions. We're going to have a lot of active missions here. We're going to have to scan all of the places, and so I don't want to like have any sort of lag issues. Right now, we're nice and green, and I want to keep it that way for as long as possible. That said, ScanSat has made many improvements. It used to be a lot more cumbersome than it is right now. There was a time when it was a big resource hog. It's much better now, but still. We do have the narrowband scanner here, and we'll see what we can do with that. I'm anticipating that that's going to be more important around Minmus than the moon. We're just going to do a basic resource scan of the moon, and then this will permanently park itself around Minmus. Now, I've configured this launch script to try to do the burn and apoapsis to circularize, so it will shut down eventually, but right now it's going with the thrall down and a mild pitch down. It's not got to pitch down more than 5 degrees in order to try and bring itself into a nice orbit continuously rather than just stopping. It probably won't quite make our intended orbit of 125 kilometers by 125 kilometers. Oh, actually it's uh, allowed to pitch more in mode 6. I might want to fix that. It's doing an okay job though. You can see 
125 by 62 but still needs to coast so it's doing that at least but we'll see how well it does it we are just ahead of apoapsis I give it some time to turn back to prograde here and then it ignites at 25 percent thrust and it's a little bit lopsided we need to have it turn quicker to prograde I had it turn slower so it didn't wiggle about but maybe I'll just tell it to go straight there instead of have it take extra time all right well anyway 150 by 125 not where I wanted it but that's because we weren't turned directly to prograde before it lit the engine okay well let's plot for the moon well the trick here is that we have to get into a polar orbit around the moon and then uh, try and transfer to Minmus of course it's much easier to go from orbit around the moon to orbit around Minmus if it's an equatorial orbit Polar orbits are a lot more annoying to break, but uh, here we come in, 271 on the periapsis, and you can see we're using a bit of a normal burn in order to make sure that we get a polar orbit initially, but that doesn't add too much to our overall cost, well, 132 basically if you look at the prograde, but um, yeah, uh, actually... The thing is, we also have to have a particular timing in order to get this trajectory right. A mid-course adjustment might be cheaper. But anyway, I'll go with this since I have it plotted. Actually, we have a lot of a lot of extra delta V. Even though this is our lightest launcher, it obviously can launch this 1.5 ton probe. Let me show you the delta V stats. It's about a 1.5 ton probe. It can launch this probe very easily and still have plenty of fuel for a transfer to the moon with this stage which is what we're planning on right now so I mean Delta V wise we have plenty of stuff we don't have to worry let's deploy probably we're not going to get that nice arc above the moon our trajectory will probably be a bit off and we'll have to correct but this stage should not only be able to transfer us to the moon but get us into orbit around the moon It'd be nice if we had an easy way of disposing of this stage though. With that in mind, maybe we should crash it into the moon and have the probe itself complete everything else. Well, that's not too bad. Um, let's see what happens. Okay, that lifts it up. But I'm thinking now that I should crash it into the moon. So let's go retrograde first. Okay, now that stage is definitively crashing into the moon. Let's uh, separate it off. Okay, and our little probe is ready. Just a stock tank. We've got two, uh, four, sorry, four little procedural tanks as well. Just because I couldn't bear to not have something interesting about this. Uh, we've got the narrowband scanner on this side. That's why we have the batteries on this side. And we also have an extra commutatron just in case my little uh, commutatron 16s aren't good enough. Okay, that's looking like a good polar orbit around... Well, okay, now it's going all over the place. Um, we'll adjust it once we get into Mooner SOI, but that looks like a very nice polar orbit right there. So we'll take that, and we'll head on over there. Uh, Prograde, please. Still need distant object enhancements to... Uh, Ironically, to dim the skybox, <laughs> even though distant object enhancement by its name is enhancing distant objects. Technically, the skybox being very distant, but anyway. We are at a 90.6 degree inclination, which is pretty polar. Pretty polar. I think that will do just fine. And actually, as long as we get our apoapsis below 1,500 kilometers, I think that'll be good enough for this resource scanner. Okay, that should be good enough. And since we're not required to have a circular orbit, we might as well not waste the fuel. So let's see. Especially since we're going to leave anyway. Perform orbital survey. Okay, starting transmission. Ooh, okay, okay. I don't need to see it here oh, that's interesting what well first of all we need to increase the cutoff alumina okay cutoff let's not have it uh, well 70% is too high it looks like 
Okay, so we've got a patch of Illumina here, but I don't know what Illumina is for. Let's focus on ore first. Uh, let's increase the cutoff. Uh, really, we're talking about this crater and that crater as, as optimal locations. This one, not quite as good as the one up there, but that'll be tough to reach. Uh, with our equatorial station, this one is not too bad. If we're going to, of course, we're not really trying to mine stuff on the moon necessarily, but it could be helpful just to have a supplementary thing here at the moon. So, ore is there. Um, hydrates. Well, there's unsurprisingly not too many hydrates, but if you want a hydrate camp, that's also equatorial. Metallic ore. Totally different places. Okay. Gypsum, uh, up there. So that's extra enticing, but I don't, I don't know what gypsum is for yet. That's part of what I'm trying to learn here. I didn't really get to that part in previous series. Uh, silicates, we can do at the same location as we get ore. Uh, maybe if we are on the edge here, we can branch out into substrates and uraninite and water. Water is super important because we're using TAC life support. So I think the best location for a base is like around here where we could, I don't know if we could really branch out into water. I mean, there are large distances here and that's a pretty steep slope. Does not look like it's rover friendly. We might need two camps anyway. Okay, but anyway, we have our results. Let's check up on okay let's turn off the overlay and we will check up on Minmus uh, well that should do the trick 361 is definitely within the orbital survey area I think Minmus is smaller though but I think this should be good and then we'll have to bring it down for the narrow narrow band scanner okay the node is only in one minute, so let's hurry up. Okay, let's see what's really going on here. Hopefully we have, a, we have an encounter. We will find out. Uh, where's my encounter? Oh, there it is. There's my encounter. Okay, get closer, get closer, get closer. That's not exactly the approach I was looking for. Mm. Oh, that that's polar. It's polar the opposite direction, but it's polar. I'll take it. It's not far enough away though, so we'll have to do a maneuver here. Okay, that's good enough. And 87.9 degree inclination, still close enough to polar. Let's get to periapsis. Where is Minmus? Um, there's, there's Kerbin and the moon, and Minmus is there. We may need to wrangle an asteroid or two, give Minmus some companions. Wrangling asteroids is bound to be much more difficult in here than it is in stock, so it should be interesting. Because we are at 2.5x scale. We will eventually need to get this to a lower orbit. So we are making a tighter orbit around here than we did around the moon, but we don't, don't need to go lower than that, I think. Perform orbital survey. Looks like it accepts this altitude. And there we go. Science added. And we've got survey data. Let's take a look at the overlay. Doesn't show anything there. Let's see. Hmm... Lower the cutoff. Let's start with ore. Well, there's plenty of ore. 80% cutoff. Well, that's 90%. 80% cutoff. There's still plenty of ore uh, under the orbit of our station right now. Maybe down here. Let, let's just focus on down here and see what other things we can find. Alumina, not so much. But what if we reduce the cutoff? Ah, yeah, actually, at a 70% cutoff, there's some visible here. Dirt. Really? Dirt's hard to come by, huh? Only 30% here. Exotic minerals, totally not. We'll have to go up there. 
and that's the only place on Minmus to get exotic minerals. Gypsum? Not quite in the patch we we're looking at, a little bit to the west. Hydrates are good. Um, hydrates, 90%, 90%, wow. Minmus is very hydrated. Um, if we reduce the cutoff here, do we get... No, this patch is definitely bare of gypsum. Carbonite, well, we're not really concerned with carbonite. We're going to stick to ore. Metallic ore. Um, yeah, uh, this is a bad patch for metallic ore. We'll have to go to the west again. Same with minerals. So, gypsum, metallic ore, minerals, all in the same band, sort of over here-ish. Monazite, Monazite is uh, good enough in the same area as the ore is. Rare metals, not so much. And also not in the same location as the gypsum and all. Silicates, uh, no silicates here. Substrate, no, well, okay. Uh, at a lower level, there is substrate here. Uraninite, no. I mean, there is elsewhere on Minmus, just not in the patch we were looking at. And how about water? Ah, that's a deal breaker. Well, well, not really, I guess. Well, we could get some water up there, but not much. I guess we will be getting our water from the moon. Yeah, I don't think it's worthwhile. A 20% cutoff and it all disappearing at 30%. Uh, it looks like water, water mining will have to occur at the moon. Okay, so I need to know about this narrowband scanner. Uh, it looks like it's doing stuff. I thought I needed a lower altitude. Let's go back to the VAB and check the altitude for the narrowband scanner, and then we'll continue with other things. Okay, well, it says scans are enhanced while landed on the ground, splashdown, or standing by to launch. So, not, not as good in orbit, but it is functional in orbit up to a max altitude of 1,250, no wait, I'm missing, uh, yeah, 1,250 kilometers. Just checking, I got all the zeros there. Okay, so let's just keep it there and we'll have to add, a, add an aeroband scanner to a rover or something. But on to the next thing. Okay, hello everyone, and it is a new dawn here at the Space Center where we intend to launch the first four modules of our lunar station all at once on a Duna 6 rocket. Uh, this is a precarious payload, obviously. The payload is almost as tall as the launcher itself. Uh, Delta V-wise, we appear to have enough not only to make orbit around Kerbin, but of course to transfer over to the moon and make orbit there. But let's see if this works. Um, yep, yeah, this should be interesting. I'll show you the payload once we decouple the fairings, if that happens to occur successfully. But here we go. Uh, well, a, a decent amount of auto strutting has occurred, but we'll see whether it's enough. All right. Um, let me take a look at the Duna 6 launch script here. I haven't adjusted it to do the um, circularization burn or anything. Otherwise, the numbers seem to be all right. Let's try it out. I don't recall having any obvious problems with it. We're going to need to launch a material kit mission to the station afterwards to actually expand one of the modules. And we don't have a full load of machinery yet. Oh, rotation. Okay. Okay, we'll go away. I sh really need to... Okay, we've got a bit of a... Hold on, let me see if SAS helps. Bit of a rotation problem here. Uh... Well, let's see if it survives. Um, we we obviously have a wiggly payload right now. Auto we did not auto strut enough clearly, but we might still make it. I mean, it's not deviating that much from prograde, even though roll, pitch, and yaw are going all over the place. Okay, boosters have decoupled. We're sort of decelerating at this point. Uh, but now we're picking up again. No big mystery about what the...
major issue coming up is it's fairing separation. With these huge fairings, there's no telling what's going to happen, whether it's going to take out the rocket or not. Will they decouple with enough force to clear them from the rocket? That's the question. Okay, well, things are getting a little bit tight here. I think I'm going to have to separate fairings after separating the first stage, so that's good. On the other hand, it's throttling down, so it's quite complicated. Okay, yeah. Okay, we are now on the second stage. It's wiggling a lot more right now. And I can't imagine that that's going to get better after we separate the fairing, but we'll see. Uh, we seem to, something went puff. Okay, inner stage fairing adapter exploded. Well, that's fine. Okay, the huge fairings are off, and it looks like they're actually clear. Um, we are getting overheating on the front docking port and some of the modules right now. But those overheating indicators are going away, it looks like. And indeed. Still very wiggly, but uh, it survived. It has survived so far. Lots of docking ports, I guess. You know, there's always a little bit of wiggle there. These are not uh, construction docking ports from USI. These are common berthing mechanisms from, uh, I think it's the CX Aerospace pack. Okay, we are getting close to orbit here. Still on the continuous burn, though, throttle down quite a lot here. Let's see what it does. It's <laughs> that wiggle, though. At least it's a controlled wiggle. We need this stage, of course, to get us to the moon and make orbit around the moon as well. There is a tug up front, but it can't do too much. Just supposed to help with orientation. Okay, it shut off at 126 by 60. That's fine. We'll I'll do the coast to apoapsis and finish the orbit. I've got a thing there to recharge. That'll retract once the station is all put together. You can see how the station is. We've got a docking hub up here. We've got an inflatable habitation ring here. Uh, we've got an agricultural module here. And then a tundra colonization module there. These are 3.75 meter modules, so big. And we've got additional uh, common berthing mechanisms on the bottom. If you remember in the previous episode, I showed you this moon station in full glory and uh, additional modules will be attached down there and also on the tail. Okay, hopefully everything else is all right. And let me plot for them. Oh, oh let me get into orbit first. <laughs> Let's not forget getting into orbit. Easy to get carried away here. Okay, we are currently turning towards the node and let's see, this looks pretty cinematic, doesn't it? Looking good. Okay, looks good. I think we're just about there. Let's go. Oh, actually we had a little bit further to go there. All right. Significant progress on our moon station if this works. And from here on we'll try and launch many modules at the same time. Though we'll see, it depends on how heavy the modules are and how bulky they are too. Okay, here we go. Looks like we have plenty of fuel. And that is a good match. Let's see, periapsis, a little bit low, huh? Let's turn on that RCS and lift that up a bit. Let's go for 60 kilometers for a start. Okay. How about giving us a cinematic departure from the Earth? Um, a little bit faster. Uh, okay, a little bit faster. Alright, now we are approaching the moon. We're going to be equatorial, but that was according to plan. And it seems like there are locations close enough to the equator that have resources. So we are not at a disadvantage. But this is to make it easier to get to the we get to Minmus and uh, 
reach here from Minmus. I think somewhere on here I actually have a controller. Uh, I, yeah, I tucked it into the tank. We do have a remote guidance unit, so I think we can deorbit this as long as we can do it while it still has that 30 electric charge there. Of course, we could dismantle it for material kits too. Certainly, we should wait until we have a way to... You know what would have been a good idea? Is if we dismantle this for material kits and use this as a tank for the station. Uh, lost opportunity there. Okay, 61 by 58, and we'll leave this as it is. We can't inflate that yet. Um, it doesn't even give us an option. That's a little bit worrying. Um, yeah, because we don't have the material kits, we can't inflate it, but I really wish it'd give us the option to inflate it. Okay, um, definitely not toggle ground tether. I was worrying about the auto struts. Uh, see, I, I don't want to auto strut the heaviest part anymore. Okay, hopefully all auto strutting is currently disabled, and that might solve some of our wiggly problems. Uh, well, not wiggly problems, but loading problems, because the heaviest part changes depending on what's docked to the station. Anyway, so here we are in orbit around the moon, current mass, uh, 47 tons. Actually, our module mass is 30 tons it's 26 without the tug i think the tug adds the rest of the mass not sure okay anyway we will leave it be uh oh wait um i might want some auto strutting actually look at that as soon as i turn auto strutting off it started this okay let's do root part then okay now it's stabilized kerbal likes its auto strutting actually maybe we should do that with the Kerbin Orbit Station too, since we saw sort of w similar wiggliness with that. I'll quickly do that and then we'll get on with the next thing. Alright, we conclude with a shuttle launch and in this case this is KTS-2. I'm going with KTS as our mission numbering system and this is the Kerbosity shuttle. The Audacity shuttle had to undergo certain repairs after the splashdown last time. So this is the shuttle Kerbosity carrying the Carpenter module and the Z1 module to our Kerbin Orbit space station. And uh, we'll talk more about it on the way up. But uh, here we go, running the shuttle launch script. Okay, and we're off. It's a little bit tricky with the station modules because we're using common berthing mechanisms and they have an active and a passive side. And so we have to make sure that we get that right. We are carrying a tug in here because the tug that we already have at the space station doesn't have one of the sides of the common roofing mechanism and we actually need both this time. Our Kerbals all look a little bit distraught and that's because while they are very, very sharp Kerbals, our new recruits, uh, they aren't particularly stupid. <laughs> so. So anyway, they're feeling a little bit better now. Uh, the new recruits are Kaiser Kerman, uh, Nathaniel Kerman, uh, uh, Dash, Dafdos Kerman, Dafdos Kerman, and Hadnan Kerman, and uh, two pilots, an engineer, and a scientist all together. Uh, it looks like uh, I think that's a camera overheating, so no worries there. We did have to fix something, but I forget what that was. I guess we're, we're about to find out. These do uh, trail off on their thrust, by the way, so they do have a thrust curve, which is interesting. They do have a shuttle-like thrust curve. Oh, that's bad. Hmm. Well, at least they didn't take out the, the bomb of the external tank this time. I wonder why the timing was off. Because the boosters are supposed to just last however long the boosters last. Ooh, I think there was a problem with the boosters actually throttling down when this throttles down, which they shouldn't, obviously. Yeah, I need to fix that. Yeah, obviously SRBs are not supposed to throttle down with... I mean, th having a thrust curve is one thing. Throttling down with the main throttle is a totally different thing. But yeah, they seem to have inconsistent burn times. And we're going to have to work on that. 
there's always something. No matter how simple you try and make something, there's always uh, a curious flaw. I did add separatrons to the external tank so that it uh, goes off cleanly and doesn't bump into the shuttle. We could do like a shuttle RCS maneuver, but this is simpler. And you can see I've angled the Sceptrons so that they don't actually blast the shuttle. Hopefully. It's a pretty heavy payload. I mean, we're talking about the Z1 truss, the carpenter module, which is similar to Destiny, and a tug. So, more than we have previously carried with this shuttle. Okay, the shuttle is undergoing its normal rotation. Okay, we are in the final phase of the launch burn here. The shuttle is throttled down. And let's see if it has enough fuel for this particular payload, again, heavier than normal. What we're looking for is a periapsis that will still deorbit the external tank, of course. Uh, apoapsis a bit high, but uh, we went high with the previous launch as well. We'll have the station catch up with us. All right, 186 is pretty high. But, should be fine. Okay, the external tank is off, <laughs> spinning precariously, but still. Okay. It looks like internally we have 437 meters per second, which is a bit tight. Well, it seems to still have a problem with doing the circularization burn. And, ETA to apoapsis less than 60, circularization burn equals zero. Apparently it, the variable wasn't there? I don't know why. Let me uh, take a look at that while we actually do the circularization burn. Okay, that should do. Let's get on with the rendezvous. It's uh, just a bit behind us, which is good, because we're letting it catch up to us. And let's open up the cargo bay. And it's a little bit dark right now, but you can see this is the Z1 truss, this is the, the tug, and this is the, well, it's called XRS activity module, but we call it Carpenter. And unfortunately, this little... Um, Ku band uh, communication antenna sort of clips into the tug, but that's not a big problem. We'll extend it as soon as it's out of the cargo bay. And this side of the tug is the passive side that will attach to this active one, but the opposite side is is uh, active berthing mechanism attaching to the passive one at the top of the Z1 truss. We still need to put more TAC life support stuff in the shuttle. I didn't change the shuttle at all since the last time. Mainly my concern this time is trying to get it closer to the KSC on return. No guarantees we'll actually hit the KSC. What I've done is I've changed the base periapsis from 42 kilometers to 37 kilometers, and then it modifies that based on the shuttle's mass, the KOS script does. Okay, getting ready to park near the station. I've unlocked the fuel in the tug as well as in the module itself there. It's got some mod propellant, and that's why we're reading more Delta V than we had before. Okay, so make sure this has power, first of all. Yes, it does, just a little bit. That has more power anyway. And the Z1 truss famously has lots of reaction wheels. Decouple. Okay, switch. Okay, RCS is on. Uh, okay, there we go. I don't know about the RCS booms, whether they work or not. But we have them for now. Oh, let me extend that antenna. Uh, okay, so we need to dock this onto the Glen module. And I don't know if this is the top of the Glen module. Uh, yeah, well there's a targeted docking port and this is active, that one's passive, so that's a good match. Okay, slow down. 
Uh, let me retract this solar panel. It's sort of interfering with that antenna and it might break off once we separate from the Z1 truss. Hopefully this common berthing mechanisms aren't quite so picky about rotation but I don't know. I have not tried to dock with these particular docking ports yet. Okay, we have magnetism. Um, they seem a pretty good match right now. But it's not indicating a dock right now. Well, shucks. Uh Oh, no, there it is. Phew. So a little bit problematic, not not as smooth as your regular docking ports, but but at least it docked. Okay. Now this unit has an active port there. Let's go back to the shuttle for a sec. This one has an active port. Anyway, we have to move this uh this tug off anyway because that's where we need to dock the new module. Then it doesn't have the right kind of port. We need a passive port. So, back to this tug. It is now going to... that side is active, but its opposite side, this side, is passive. So, we only have 15 electric charge, which is a little bit tricky because we'll need to retract the solar panels to get into the shuttle's cargo bay. But we'll retract these RCS booms first. Oh, well, that's going to be annoying too. The booms are sort of in the way. Oh. We may have problems. Let's put it that way. Let's find out. Maybe we'll have to release the module from the shuttle first and then grab it with this. We don't have a lot of time with our electric charge running out though. Okay, that's parked. Next. No, next. Yes. Um. Oh, wow, that's got a lot of decoupling force. Um, not great. Okay, bumped. It's rising out. We're moving out. Okay, should be free. Right, set that, uh, no, set that as target. Okay. Five units left. Okay. Um. Okay, so rotation matters. Rotation matters, but we grabbed it. We got it. We've only got 146 electric charge uh, But it should be enough. Let's control from this docking port now Yeah, even with these common berthing mechanisms the rotation matters which is going to cause problems, but Let's just focus on the task at hand. I'll also extend these solar panels again now Okay, so will this be rotated in a way that I actually want it to be rotated? I don't know. Okay, so it's target. That is the construction port for the main truss. That has to be on top. We have to be like this. But is it going to let me be like this? That I do not know. Well, we are about to find out whether this is going to be legal or not. That tree might get in the way. Oh, shucks. Don't get in the way, tree. Okay. We have off kilter magnetism. Hold on. Um. Hmm, my guess is that we can't dock it like this. 
Shoot. Uh... Oh, but that works. And I think that's close enough. Let's see. Oh, no, it works great. Actually, I was probably a bit off. Okay, so our carpenter module is docked to the Glen module. We now have a four module station. And it's looking okay. It's looking okay. I wonder if we should get a Kerbal out to blast those decals that are too big, but let's let's not go overboard. Um, let's see, we've got a active port there. This one was a passive port, so we know we've got an active port on the other tug. Where can we dock it? We may have to dock it... Um, maybe we should try docking it to this Hoyo docking port since it's got one of those docking ports. Okay, well I mean we've bumped into it, but I'm not sensing any attraction between these ports. Let me retract these and try and do the rotational thing. Oh, yeah, I mean, before, whenever we approach these ports, Ooh, that's probably too vigorous. Um, there was some magnetism between them before we did... the dance of rotation. Um, now, right now there isn't. I don't know. I do not sense any magnetism at all right now. I think, oh wait, well that's pretty close, but yeah, there's no magnetism, it's just we can get it very close, but there's no attachment. No, wait, that's off. I don't know, these these ports are uh, confusing me. Hmm, maybe I should try the bottom one? Okay, this time I felt some magnetism, so that's good. Okay, and that seems close. Let's see, can we bring it in? Yes, it's brought into dock. Okay, we have docked that tug. Everything is all right. Let's retract this little panel, it's a little bit precarious. Okay, so two tugs docked. We got the S1 truss on, we've got the, the carpenter module on, and this is our Kerbin orbit station right now. So. Uh, we launched a probe to scan the moon in Minmus, we launched four modules to the moon, and we launched uh, two new modules for the station. The space shuttle is still in orbit, but I think I'll have to wait until the beginning of the next episode to bring it back. So, on that note, thank you for watching. I hope you enjoyed this video. If you did enjoy this video, please do press like. If you have any comments or suggestions, please leave them in the comment section below, and I'll see you next time.